icon of American music making, the early history of Carnegie Hall was very much tied to European composers. And it wasn't practice which got them here, but raw cash, much of it stemming from the largesse of Scottish-born steel magnate Andrew Carnegie. On the 6th of May, 1891, the New York Times reported, this city is now provided with a building in which concerts of all kinds can be given with advantage. The new music hall at 57th Street and 7th Avenue, which is substantially a present to the music lovers of New York from one of their number, Andrew Carnegie, was formally opened last night. The first piece of music performed that opening night was the Old Hundredth, a 16th century hymn tune from a Swiss manuscript composed by a Frenchman. The conductor was Walter Damroche, a German. After some Beethoven and a brief intermission was the star attraction to open America's newest concert hall, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. He walked on stage to tumultuous applause and conducted his March Solennelle. And with the clapping that followed, Carnegie Hall's opening night came to an end without a single note of American music being played. Vorjak, Strauss, Rachmaninoff, Schoenberg, Hindemith, Edgar Varez and Benjamin Britten all presented world premieres of their symphonies, concertos and chamber music here. Maybe each of them, in some way, were trying to kick-start an American compositional movement. Music critic Alex Ross. Of this group of leading European composers, it was Gustav Mahler who really had the most sustained engagement with American music. He wrote home, Since New Yorkers are completely unprejudiced, I hope I shall here find fertile ground for my works, and thus a spiritual home, something that for all the sensationalism I should never be able to achieve in Europe. Gustav Mahler's period in New York began with a flurry of excitement and fantastic press. The New York Times review of his 1908 debut at the Metropolitan Opera, where he conducted Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, was simply titled Remarkable. A few months later, and very much in demand, he became chief conductor of the New York Philharmonic. Perhaps if Mahler had lived longer, he would have immersed himself in New York all the more as in the unfinished 10th symphony. This funeral procession, which is heard at the beginning of the final movement, was a direct echo of something that Mahler witnessed out of his hotel window, a funeral procession for the deputy chief of the New York Fire Department, who was killed while fighting a fire in 1908, and Mahler was very deeply struck by these isolated thuddings of a drum outside of his window with fragments of music in between, and you hear exactly that sound uh, at the beginning of the final movement of the 10th. West 73rd Street and Broadway is the heart of the Upper West Side. In the 70s, this exact location was known as Needle Park, sort of headquarters for local drug dealers. But now it's reverted to being known by its official title, Verdi Square. In the middle of the square is a large statue of Verdi looking south down Broadway. From here, I can look across to the Ansonia building, one of the great landmarks of the Upper West Side. And upon its opening in 1904, it was the greatest apartment and hotel building in New York, best known for its famous residents like Igor Stravinsky, Sergei Rachmaninoff and Gustav Mahler. Mahler was appointed to the Metropolitan Opera in 1908, but was ousted in favour of a young conductor recently arrived from Italy, Arturo Toscanini, another resident of the Ansonia. And Valfredo Toscanini is his grandson. The building really has a French mansard at the top, and it's one of those great hotels that was built in the early part of this century. A wonderful haven for so many musicians from Europe at that time. Stravinsky had lived here, Rachmaninoff had lived here. One of the other residents who lived here was Gustav Mahler. Yes. Your grandfather was favored over Mahler and uh, took over running the Metropolitan Opera. Well, he himself felt totally obligated to give his utmost to make the music 
emotionally available to the audience. And he himself wouldn't be satisfied until he did that. So he tortured himself first, and then he tortured the orchestra and the singers. <laughs> Toscanini in New York rehearsing the triumphal march from Aida with a beleaguered NBC radio orchestra. Actually, this park and looking at the Sonia Hotel reminds me that grandfather lived here when in 1910, 100 years ago in December, he premiered The Girl of the Golden West. Puccini was here and it was the first worldwide premiere that the Met had ever given. And he was busy correcting things that Puccini had made mistakes on. Or it was being written by Puccini, corrected by grandfather, and rehearsed at the Met down on 39th Street. The fact that Puccini's opera took the Wild West as its setting was not lost on the critics. For the first time in the history of opera, an Italian grand opera with an American theme for the subject of its libretto had its initial production last night and in the Metropolitan Opera House, reported the New York Herald. Puccini called a press conference just before leaving New York in 1910. My heartfelt thanks for your kind words. I'm deeply grateful to the great public of New York for the enthusiastic welcome they've given my operas and conclude by cheering America forever. Thomas Addis is a British composer who's had his work premiered at Carnegie Hall. I guess there is a very different history if you're a composer from England or somewhere. Inevitably, your makeup is, I suppose, to an American, fascinatingly different <laughs> from theirs. Well, I just know in my own experience that the piece I wrote for New York Philharmonic, America Prophecy, it really was not understood at its premiere, but I guess it's a piece that no American composer would dream of writing. Because it's not at all optimistic about the place. What I'm doing in it is based very much on the constant invasion paranoia that you see in all the movies and uh, stories in America all the time. And then it wasn't done for a while for very good reasons after 9-11. And then I went back and I remember realising that it developed a kind of slight cult following on the recording, partly probably because... The idea of a piece called America, which is so completely destructive, <laughs> was quite interesting to a certain corner of the American public because I think perhaps it's something that an American composer would never have done. There have been many waves of cultural exile to hit New York's shores, not least that which followed the Russian Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Sergei Prokofiev arrived in New York the following year via San Francisco, but he had a short-lived and pretty miserable time in the city with very little interest in his work. He left for Europe in 1920. His compatriot, Sergei Rachmaninoff, also arrived here in 1918, and he had a much better time of it. Philip Ramey is an American composer living in New York. Rachmaninoff never got used to being in exile. But he used to say, Russia doesn't exist anymore, after the evil Soviets took over. And even signed a letter 